So for those of you who are just coming in, we'll be starting in a few minutes. So good afternoon. On behalf of Woodsworth College, I would like to welcome you all to this virtual presentation of the annual Saul Goldstein Memorial Lecture. I would like to begin by acknowledging this sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. It has been a site of human activity for more than 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. The territory was the subject of the Dish With One Spoon, Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Islands, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to meet and to share knowledge on this land. My name is Carol Chin and I have the privilege of serving as principal of Woodsworth College. The college is home to over 5,000 students studying in the Faculty of Arts and Science here at the University of Toronto. We are proud to offer access programs to post-secondary education through our Millie Rotman Scheim Academic Bridging Program and our Diploma to Degree programs, which are partnerships with local community colleges in the GTA. This lecture is named for Saul Goldstein, a Woodsworth College student who graduated in 2004 at the age of 93. When Saul passed away in 2007, family and friends established this lecture series in his honor. Sincere thanks to the Goldstein family for their support and, th and thoughtfulness in honoring Mr. Goldstein's memory this way. I know that Roger Goldstein is in attendance this afternoon. Uh, there may be other members of the family here, but I can't actually see them on Zoom. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Professor Phil, Professor Phil Triadophilopoulos is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. He teaches courses in political science and public policy at the University of Toronto Scarborough and the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and conducts research in the areas of immigration and citizenship policy in Europe and North America. Professor Triadophilopoulos holds a PhD in political science from the New School for Social Research in New York, and he is a former Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada postdoctoral fellow, as well as a visiting fellow at the Institute for German Studies at the University of Birmingham. His current research examines the extension of public funding for Islamic religious education in Canada and Germany, as well as amongst other topics, the role of established national churches in the politics of minority religious accommodation in Europe. He is the author of Becoming Multicultural, Immigration and the Politics of Membership in Canada and Germany, published in 2012, and European Encounters, Migrants, Migration, and European Societies Since 1945. It was published in 2003. As well, he has published many scholarly articles in a variety of journals on the subject of migration studies and citizen citizenship studies. The title of his lecture today is Revolutionary Pragmatist, Revolutionary Pragmatist, question mark, Angela Merkel and the Transformation of Migration Policy in Germany. At the end of this lecture, we will have some Q&A as well. So you can put your questions into the Q&A chat. So please join me in welcoming Professor Phil Triadafilopoulos. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chin, for your generous introduction. 
I'm very grateful to have the privilege of delivering this year's Saul Goldstein Memorial Lecture. Based on what I've managed to learn about him, Mr. Goldstein was a remarkable man, and it's truly an honor to give a lecture celebrating his life and his memory. I thank Barbara Truck for inviting me to be this year's lecture, and I'm grateful for the help I've received from our host, Stephanie Woodside. And again, my sincere thanks go to Professor Carol Chin uh, for agreeing to moderate today's discussion after the lecture. Um, let's get right to it then. I will share my screen with you. I hope that shows up. It's very uh, awkward, as we all know, to give a public address via Zoom, but I have my faith in our brilliant technical person uh, that Benjamin would that uh, everything is in order. If it isn't, please shout at me. Uh, why a revolutionary pragmatist? The basic argument that I want to make today uh, is as follows. Angela Merkel's four terms as Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany from 2005 to just this year coincided with a profound shift in Germany's immigration policies. Germany went from being an exclusionary outlier that refused to acknowledge its status as an immigration country to Europe's foremost country of immigration, arguably the cosmopolitan center of Europe today, and the epicenter, in my view, is Berlin. It's important to stress that prior to the Merkel years, immigration was among the most contested topics in German politics. Today, Germany's two largest parties, the Christian Democratic Union, the CDU, and the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, have roughly similar positions, as do the Greens and the Free Democrats, the FDP. Merkel's principal achievement, in my reckoning, was to turn down the heat on immigration by building consensus on key issues, namely the imperative, if, the imperative of integration for individuals with a migration background, the admission of new immigrants to help meet labor market demands, the modernization of citizenship policy, and the building of a welcoming culture that is appealing to potential immigrants and inclusive of all citizens. Merkel's approach to asylum and refugee policy is also key. She famously refused to close Germany's borders during the refugee crisis of late summer 2015. As I will point out, this act of humanitarian openness was quickly balanced by a coldly realist recognition that a democratically viable system of managed migration could only succeed in Germany when the state could demonstrate that it is able to control its borders effectively. In essence, Germany has since joined the ranks of other immigration countries like Canada, pursuing a selective immigration policy that serves the needs of the host society while providing relatively narrow openings for asylum seekers, refugees, and other unselected migrants. So I've organized the lecture as follows. First, I'll provide a, a very brief biographical sketch of Angela Merkel. Then we'll uh, do a very quick run through Germany's post-war, post-World War II immigration history, and then focus on those years when uh, Angela Merkel was chancellor from 2005 to 2021, paying attention to her uh, positions on integration, labor migration, and the building of a welcome culture, citizenship and belonging, and asylum and refugee policy. Uh, the fourth part of the lecture will pay special attention to the 2015 refugee crisis, and then we'll conclude by reiterating the argument that I'm trying to make today. So who is Angela Merkel? I'm sure most of you know as much or more about the former chancellor than I do. Nevertheless, the very basic sketch that follows may help us better understand her political style. Angela Kasner was born in July, 1954 in the West German city of Hamburg. Her father Horst, a Lutheran pastor emigrated along with Angela and her mother 
to the communist German Democratic Republic two months later, eventually settling in Templin, a small town in Brandenburg. She earned her Abitur, her high school leaving diploma in 1973, and went on to study physics, physics at Leipzig University. She married fellow student Ulrich Merkel in 1977, and they divorced in 1982. Merkel completed her doctorate in physical chemistry in 1986. She became active in politics in 1989, shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. She served as the deputy spokesperson of the East German, uh, the first uh, government democratically elected in what became the former East Germany, uh, a government that was led by the CDU. And she went on to rise through the ranks of the CDU after the first federal election of a reunified Germany in December 1990. She served in Chancellor Helmut Kohl's cabinet and became the party's deputy chair in 1991. Famously in 1998, she broke with Kohl after the former chancellor was implicated in a scandal. By this time, the CDU FDP coalition that had ruled Germany since 1982 was in opposition and a coalition made up of the Social Democrats and Greens held power. Merkel was appointed the party's general secretary in 1998 and its parliamentary caucus chair in 1999. Merkel was passed over as the union's chancellor candidate in the 2002 federal election in favor of the Christian Social Union's Edmund Stoiber. Stoiber, a arch conservative, ran what most political scientists agree was a dismal campaign and uh, the Red-Green Coalition unsurprisingly won a second term in office. Merkel was the CDU's chancellor candidate in the 2005 federal election and following a very close vote was appointed chancellor and formed a grand coalition government with the SPD. So what do we take away from this biographical sketch? First, as someone raised in East Germany, Angela Merkel was an outsider to the world of West German politics, and politics in a reunified Germany was West German. Merkel has jokingly referred to herself as someone with a migration background, a term usually reserved for immigrants and their children. Second, as has been stressed repeatedly, but with good reason, she has a cool analytical bent. Science is about incremental progress through experimentation. I believe this is very much in keeping with the former chancellor's political style. Third, and finally, Merkel is tough. She managed to emerge as the leader of a party dominated by men, many with oversized egos, and this did not come easily. So an outsider inside the halls of power with a cool analytical style and steely determination. These qualities would serve Merkel well across her four terms as chancellor of the Federal Republic. To put Angela Merkel's achievements in the area of immigration in context, we need to look back on Germany's post-war history. Migration has been central to this history, but this did not mean that Germany understood itself as an immigration country. On the contrary, as I will point out, most German leaders rejected this appellation until well into the 21st century. After Germany's defeat in the Second World War, some 12 million ethnic Germans were expelled from Czechoslovakia, Poland, and other Eastern and Central European countries. Most settled in West Germany, creating an integration challenge of epic proportions. But Marshall Plan Aid, helped rekindle the West German economy, and in time, the threat of mass unemployment among the newcomers gave way to extensive labor shortages. The Federal Republic answered these labor shortages through a system of foreign labor recruitment. The Federal Republic uh, entered into its first bilateral labor agreement with Italy in 1955. Italian workers were granted permission to work in Germany for a limited time, mostly as seasonal laborers in agriculture. 
The expectation was that they would return to Italy at the end of their contracts. And by 1959, some 85,000 guest workers had been admitted. This system of foreign labor procurement expanded rapidly to keep pace with Germany's post-war economic boom, the so-called economic miracle. Bilateral agreements were struck with Greece in 1960, Turkey in 1961, Portugal in 1964, and Yugoslavia in 1968. Already in 1964, the total number of foreign workers in the Federal Republic was over 1 million. The settlement of guest workers was based on economic need and changing norms. On the one hand, employers demanded workers and were not interested in losing them once they'd been trained and had gained experience. Rotating them, asking them to leave Germany and then apply to return, did not make any sense from a business perspective. At the same time, the Federal Republic was eager to cast itself as a progressive democratic country far removed from the racial excesses of the Nazi regime. Compelling guest workers to leave Germany against their will would have clashed with the same. And so German officials hoped that voluntary rotation would ensure that foreign workers remained temporary. As is well known, these hopes were misplaced. While most foreign workers did return to their home countries, many opted to remain in the Federal Republic and were in time joined by their spouses and children. And by 1973, West Germany was host to 2.6 million foreigners. German officials abruptly ended their foreign labor recruitment system in November, 1973. When governments tried to challenge former guest workers' rights to remain in West Germany and be joined by their families through family reunification, courts intervened and upheld their rights under the basic law, the constitution of West Germany. By the election year of 1983, the total number of foreigners in West Germany, and by foreigners, I mean a term that also refers to German-born children of foreign workers, the total number of foreigners had risen to 4.5 million people or 7.4% of the population. Germany had become a de facto immigration country. The end of the Cold War led to significant increases in migration to Germany. Article 16 of the basic law granted asylum seekers persecuted on political grounds, the absolute right to make a refugee claim in the Federal Republic. While such claims were relatively infrequent until the late 1980s, they increased significantly after the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia and the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The Federal Republic received 1,434,360 applications for asylum between 1988 and 1993. The end of the Cold War also loosened restrictions on exit for peoples in the former Eastern Bloc allowing hundreds of thousands of ethnic German repatriates, Spätausliedler, to take advantage of the Federal Republic's constitutional guarantee of unencumbered admission and citizenship to all ethnic Germans in communist countries. By the mid 1990s, Germany's foreign population had reached almost 7 million or 8.5% of the total population. Yet Germany had no immigration or integration policy to speak of. While former guest workers had rights to welfare benefits and other forms of social assistance, access to these services was mediated by non-governmental welfare organizations run by the Catholic and Protestant churches and the trade unions. Migrant children could attend public schools, but little effort was put into reforming the system to better meet their needs. Language training, when provided at all, was ad hoc with little governmental oversight. While the SPD, Greens, and to a lesser extent, the FDP began to acknowledge the need to recognize Germany's de facto transformation into a country of immigration, the CDU CSU stubbornly clung to its mantra that Germany was not and could not become a country of immigration. The union's leadership in governing coalitions through the 1980s and most of the 1990s ensure that little progress was made with respect to enacting much needed reforms. 
The inability to adapt to changing realities was glaringly obvious with respect to citizenship. Germany's anachronistic naturalization policies, based on a law passed in 1913, ensured that citizenship was reserved for ethnic Germans. For the most part, long settled migrants and their German born children remained foreigners. This political impasse coincided with waves of anti immigrant violence directed at both asylum seekers and long settled immigrant families. The mounting chaos forced the SPD and CDU. CSU to agree to a so-called asylum compromise in December 1992, whereby Article 16 of the Basic Law would be amended to narrow access to asylum seekers. In exchange for this concession, the union parties agreed to facilitate naturalization for foreign youth and to introduce limits on the admission of ethnic German repatriates. After its re-election in 1995, the CDU-CSU-FDP coalition effectively sat on its hands, maintaining the union stance that Germany was not an immigration country. There were no new policies passed until the next government. And so the election of 1998 was an important turning point in Germany's immigration history, bringing in a coalition of the Social Democrats and Greens into power under the leadership of Chancellor Gerhard Schröder, seen here with Green Party leader and soon to be Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer. The green, Red Green Coalition broke new ground by acknowledging that Germany's uh, <clears throat> broke new ground by acknowledging that Germany had indeed been transformed by immigration and made the liberalization of Germany's citizenship law one of its top priorities. A bill that included elements of birthright citizenship for children born in Germany was introduced in 1999. But the union parties opposed the bill and with the help of the FDP forced an amendment requiring children of immigrants born in Germany and therefore granted citizenship under the proposed law to choose either their German citizenship or that of their parents between the ages of 18 and 23. An immigration law that sought to move Germany to a managed migration system that favored highly skilled workers was also opposed by the union parties. When it was finally passed in 2004, most of its pro-immigration provisions had been gutted. In a small victory, what became known as the Residency Act of 2004 did require that the federal government support the integration of legally resident foreigners. By the 2005 election, Germany's immigration and citizenship policies remained mired in partisan strife. While the Red-Green Coalition had scored some breakthroughs with respect to citizenship in particular, these victories were limited by the opposition of the CDU CSU. Immigration remained a highly politicized policy field. The need for more action on immigrant integration was one of the few areas of partial consensus. That is, parties agreed that integration was becoming an imperative. But even here, Germany's largest parties had some considerable differences. The close result of the 2005 federal election forced the SPD and the CDU CSU to form a grand coalition government under the leadership of Chancellor Angela Merkel. As I will point out, the necessity of governing in partnership with the SPD and Merkel's leadership style would help shift Germany's approach to immigration. So now I want to talk about that period of time from 2005 to 2021, uh, the period that Angela Merkel was Chancellor of the Federal Republic. What the new Chancellor set out to do right away was to build on areas of some consensus with her new coalition partners, the Social Democrats. With respect to immigration, that area was uh, integration. As I said earlier, there was already some agreement that integration had to be taken more seriously and more active policy interventions had to be developed. In 2006, Merkel hosted Germany's first National Integration Summit, drawing together representatives from the federal, state, and municipal levels of government, 
along with civil society actors, including organizations representing immigrant groups. This was the first time this had ever happened in Germany. In her opening statement, Merkel noted that integration was among the most pressing challenges facing Germany. Successful integration would require the efforts of the federal, state, and municipal governments, along with civil society actors and migrants themselves. According to Merkel, the key to progress lay in devising, quote, a common understanding of integration that establishes mutual duties and ties, uh, excuse me, mutual duties and rights for migrants as well as the native population, unquote. A national integration plan introduced at the second integration summit in 2007, set out a roadmap for pursuing the aims enunciated the previous year. Integration courses formed the core of this new approach. The federal government would supply the money to enable state and municipal governments to deliver mandatory classes featuring 600 hours of language training and over 100 hours of civics lessons. Additional commitments pertain to educational and vocational training, opportunities for women and girls, intercultural competence building in public and private sectors, civic participation, and media diversity. In all, the National Integration Plan included some 400 commitments on the part of the summit participants to improve the integration of immigrants and their children. Germany also began to steadily open itself to skilled immigration from beyond the European Union. The most consequential policy innovation in this area came rather recently in 2019 with the passage of the Skilled Workers Immigration Act, which reduces red tape and speeds up the process of recruiting foreign trained professionals. The emphasis on building a welcoming culture, a Willkommenskultur, accompanied the opening of Germany to skilled immigrants and in fact predates the 2019 law. Proponents of a Willkommenskultur argue that Germany needs to become more outwardly receptive of immigrants if it is to successfully compete for the world's best and brightest workers. And so welcome centers have been established in cities in Germany and abroad to provide information to would-be immigrants. The term welcoming culture has also come to be used more generally as a way of demonstrating openness for newcomers. Canadians might be excused for mistaking the rhetoric of welcome in Germany for a kind of official multiculturalism. I believe this is a reasonable inference. It is a kind of official public philosophy that makes receptiveness uh, an official position of the federal government and by extension state and local governments. In 2014, a second grand coalition joining the CDU, CSU, and SPD, did away with the 1999 citizenship laws demand that children of immigrants born in Germany choose between their German citizenship and that of their parents. According to the rules introduced in 2014, dual citizenship is to be tolerated in all cases where the children of foreign parents have been born, where the children of foreign parents have been born and raised in Germany. Citizenship is more than equal legal status. It also denotes belonging in a solidaristic political community. In my view, some of Angela Merkel's most impressive gestures have been along these lines to encourage a sense of common purpose and equal dignity among Germans with and without a migration background. Her 2012 speech requesting forgiveness for the victims of, of extreme right-wing terror offers a good case in point. I'll read a short passage to give you a sense of this. Quote, Dear bereaved, no one can bring your husband, father, son, or daughter back to you. No one can erase the years of grief and abandonment. No one can undo the pain, anger, and doubt. But we can all show you today that you are no longer alone with your grief. We feel for you. We mourn with you. As Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, I promise you, we will do everything we can to investigate the murders and uncover the accomplices and backers and bring all perpetrators to justice. All responsible authorities in the federal and state governments are working flat out on this. That is important enough, but it would not be enough because it's also about doing, about doing everything within the possibilities of our constitutional state 
so that something like this can never happen again, unquote. Merkel's ability to modernize Germany's integration, immigration, and citizenship policies was possible in part because Germany had demonstrated control over its borders since the 1990s. As this graph demonstrates, applications for asylum remained well below 50,000 per year through her first government and remained under 100,000 until 2013. Public opinion was also growing steadily more supportive of immigration and diversity. While the German economy was roaring ahead, creating labor market demand among employers across all sectors. So it was a propitious time for reform in the field of immigration. It was during this time that Merkel led governments also introduced changes to Germany's asylum and refugee policies that removed barrier, barriers to asylum seekers access to Germany's labor market. Refugees like migrants came to be understood as in need of active integration policies. While Germany like other industrialized democracies maintained tight restrictions on asylum seeking, punitive measures aimed at freezing refugees out of the labor market were set aside in favor of more pragmatic rules. And so we arrive at that pivotal year, 2015, and the so-called refugee crisis. I expect that most of you consider Angela Merkel's response to the 2015 refugee crisis among her most important political decisions, and I don't think you'd be wrong about that. Merkel's decision to not close Germany's borders led to the admission of over 1 million asylum seekers in 2015 with 476,649 making applications that year and an additional 745,554 making asylum applications in 2016. Merkel's work on normalizing immigration and integration in the preceding years certainly helped prepare Germans for the challenge of accommodating and integrating so many newcomers in such a short space of time. Indeed, one of the enduring elements of Germany's response to the refugee emergency was the outpouring of support among civil society groups and ordinary citizens. Buoyed by the public's response, Merkel famously declared, wir schaffen das, we can do this, in her speech of the 31st of August, 2015. And more than five years later, most experts agree that Germany did manage to both process an amazing number of asylum applications and successfully integrate many hundreds of thousands of individuals granted refugee status. But of course, not all Germans were keen to admit over 1 million asylum seekers. Indeed, the 2015 refugee crisis put wind in the sails of the Alternative for Germany party, turning it from a pro-austerity anti-bailout movement populated by cranky economists into a far-right anti-immigrant force. The election of far-right politicians to the German Bundestag sent tremors through Germany and throughout the world. Always the pragmatist, Merkel responded to the AFD's success by assuring Germans that the experiences of 2015 would not be repeated. Moving forward, Germany's borders would be well-regulated and asylum would be carefully controlled. This promise was upheld in part through an agreement with Turkey's increasingly authoritarian government, which exchanged EU financial support for a promise to restrict the exit of asylum seekers destined for Europe. More generally, the aim of limiting asylum seekers access to Europe has only intensified since 2015, led in part by Germany. As this graph makes clear, at least for German speakers, perhaps not so much for English speakers, this graph uh, it tells us how many uh, um, Asylum applications have been made in Germany. Those are the blue bars and the orange light orange uh, figures are um, refugees worldwide. And so what you see is that uh, Germany very quickly reduced the number of asylum seekers as reflected in the ever lower number of asylum applications in the blue bars. While the uh, need for more 
help to refugees has only increased since 2016. Uh, so the chancellor delivered on her promise, but that came with some quite serious consequences to the world's refugees. But politics requires hard choices. And I believe it's fair to say that Angela Merkel decided that in order to limit the rise of the far right and maintain popular support for a modern immigration system, she would have to make clear that Germany was able to regulate migration effectively, even if this meant pledging to never repeat the humanitarian response of 2015 and endorsing Faustian bargains with authoritarian leaders to limit flows of unwanted migrants. Under Angela Merkel's leadership, Germany has developed a system of managed migration that grants preference to skilled economic immigrants. Access to asylum seekers is closely managed and strictly limited. If this sounds familiar, it should. Germany has settled on a system that is remarkably similar to Canada's. Immigration is meant to serve the national interest. Humanitarian concerns come a distant second to economic imperatives. In this sense, Germany's response to the 2015 refugee crisis was the exception that for better or worse proves the rule. Popular support for immigration cannot be based on humanitarian principles. Nevertheless, as I hope I've demonstrated, the changes introduced under Merkel's watch were truly consequential. Germany has gone from being the standard bearer of ethno-cultural exclusion, insisting despite all appearances to the contrary that it was not a country of immigration, to Europe's premier country of immigration, where the acceptance of diversity is supported by a majority of the population and support for managed migration persists despite the electoral gains of the extreme right. No one expected this in 2005. I certainly didn't. And yet here we are. Chancellor Merkel leaves behind a more confident country in which debates over membership have been radically transformed. This is no small feat, especially for a self-professed outsider who rejected ideological fervor, opting instead for pragmatic, pragmatic problem solving, balancing principles with the demands of politics. While the path toward Germany's transformation was at times inconsistent, the end result was profound, indeed revolutionary. I thank you for your attention and I very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, is my video on as well? So uh, well, the floor is open for questions. There's one quick one here that's wondering whether the slides will be shared. Uh, I, sure, I'd love to share the slides and my speaking notes are uh, also on the slides so you'll have access to the text. <laughs> okay, I think it's possible to share slides without the speaking notes, but if you have them with it, that's, that's great too. Okay. I'm kind of proud of those notes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Right. In any case, yes, they can be available. Uh, okay, so while I guess we're waiting for people to find their way to putting questions in the chat, I guess I should start off. I'm wondering in the anti-immigrant discourse, which you know you read about in so many other countries, was there much talk about um, the birth rate of the foreigners? You know that they're the sort of breeding too much and producing more. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with respect to um, to migrants uh, from Muslim majority countries. Um, and in fact, there was one of, I think it is Germany's all time best selling nonfiction book by uh, an SPD politician named Tilo Sarazin, um, uh, roughly translated into Germany does away with itself. Uh, made this point uh, using language that was reminiscent of the sort of eugenics arguments made at the turn of the 20th century, uh, that uh, the uh, inclusion of too many foreigners from uh, majority Muslim countries was effectively dumbing down Germany's uh, overall uh, uh, level of civilization, uh, one could say fairly and leading to ruin. And so the way forward lay in carefully restricting immigration from such places and encouraging immigration from other places. I mean, it's quite remarkable that this, this thing was published in uh, 
you know, the 2010s and uh, its success speaks to still uh, a real unease and, and discomfort among many Germans with immigration, but offset, and this is the point I don't want us to lose sight of, that public opinion has shifted quite squarely towards a much more open pro-immigration, pro-diversity point of view. The, the success of the, the radical right, the AFD, has I think taken the spotlight away from that story. But the AFD in the last election, if I remember correctly, scored about 12.5% of the popular vote. I dare say that if we had a proportional representation electoral system, we'd have something similar. Uh, I, I think there's about 10 to 15% of Canadians who have points of view not dissimilar to those of AFD voters in Germany. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, now the question is starting to pile in. Uh, so from Roger Goldstein, from the Goldstein family, he says, thank you very much. Can you loop back for a moment to Chancellor Konrad Adenauer? Where are we today relative to his philosophy and is there synergy? That's a great question. Um, I think for me, the, the, the similarity comes with respect to the, the magnitude of the challenges that Adenauer on the one hand and Merkel on the other faced. Uh, these were really uh, uh, almost ex existential uh, challenges, not so much the refugee uh, crisis. And I use crisis in, in quotation marks because Germany managed to receive 1 million, uh, uh, mostly Syrian refugees, but others as well in 2015. And again, repeating myself, by all accounts, this has gone remarkably well. The country didn't uh, stop working. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, at the birth of, uh, of uh, the Federal Republic, you had, um, before the establishment of the state proper, during the period of direct occupation, you had 12 million expellees pouring into the country, mostly into West Germany. And this was handled too. It was a decades long um, challenge, but it was handled. And it was handled in part by Adenauer, mm. as was the question of uh, relationships with the allies, former uh, and still occupiers. How do you manage this? Uh, and so uh, this reminds me a bit of how you manage a relationship with your European partners that, that Merkel had to traverse. Uh, and on, in both instances, these are two level games, as we say in political science. There's a domestic political constituency that you have to be aware of and cater to, to a degree. And there's an international constituency of your peers, other national leaders, and global public opinion that you have to be uh, wary of. The existential challenge for Germany in the latter case with respect to the Euro crisis wasn't to Germany, but certainly to the Eurozone and possibly to the project of European integration more generally. And in both cases, Adenauer and Merkel succeeded. I think that is remarkable. And we could give another course, let alone a lecture on this, right? I think it's a, a wonderful question and it would make for a really great book. Mm -hmm. um, sort of like yeah. those books. Who was the ancient Roman writer who wrote Parallel Lives? Um, um, or historian Carol, who was that? Plutarch? Could be. <laughs> yeah, in any case, he, he, that would be a wonderful uh, uh, comparative analysis. Huh? Right, there you go. There's the next book. So the questions are pouring in and they're all big ones. So here's one that says, how do you expect, did I skip one? How do you expect Germany's immigration policy in the post Merkel era to change? Yeah. In your crystal ball. My guess is that it'll, it'll remain very consistent. Yeah. So Germany's already established quite a liberal approach to labor migration. That's not going to change. Um, Germany has to compete with Anglophone countries and how they do that uh, is I think the next uh, policy challenge. Although at the same time, I've been serving on a committee that awards scholarships to people who want to go study in Germany and not for that long, maybe for eight years, but every year there are more and more applications. And so many uh, North Americans want to go to Berlin, especially uh, in part to, to study at its excellent universities, but also to be part of something. And that something is not unlike Paris's status 
in other eras. Yeah, it's sort of a center of cosmopolitanism, of innovation, of change, of art, of commerce, all sorts of things um, today that it certainly wasn't when I first went there in 2000. It was kind of still a backwater uh, where not much happened and you could rent a flat for next to nothing. That's not the case now. So it, what's going to happen with respect to immigration moving forward is the new government, you have social Democrats aligned with Greens and free Democrats. On immigration, they actually have a lot in common. So mm -hmm. this is one area where you're likely to see a fair bit of action because the differences are nowhere near as stark as they are with say environmental policy or some other policy areas. Uh, they've all supported managed labor migration going back to the early 1990s. They all support a modern citizenship policy. So we may see further reforms to citizenship to get rid of some of the remaining impediments to naturalization which are still there. Germany's naturalization rate is still quite low. Mm. And so that is something that they will likely look at and probably address. Um, the idea of a, of a welcoming culture will probably be cultivated and expanded, I would expect. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the challenge of continuing to integrate now the, the children of re uh, refugees uh, as they get older, uh, will be a sort of practical uh, challenge, you know, to make the system of vocational training more receptive, to work with employers to do this. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an overwhelming challenge because the numbers in a country of 82 million are not that large, really. But it is something that I think they'll very quickly be able to find agreement on and work with state governments to do successfully. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic on this. And the final thing is a, a coalition of three parties puts up a much stronger, uh, even with Angela Merkel to the side, you know, someone of her stature, uh, three parties that are united in their opposition to radicalism and far-right ra radicalism should, I hope, uh, help um, take the, the shine off of the AFD moving forward. That, that's very good to hear, because those of us who don't specialize in this tend to hear the extremist ones. That that's what makes the news, and you're just not sure what a large proportion. So yeah. probably following up on what you were saying with the um, broad uh, support, uh, there's a question that says, could you kindly enlighten to what extent has Germany benefited from immigration capitalism, and how does it compare to Canada in that sphere? Everybody's asking big questions today. Yeah, I, I think... Um... Like all industrialized societies, Germany's uh, population is becoming ever more dependent on immigration to fulfill labor market demands. Uh, in Canada, uh, all growth in the labor market is due to immigration now. Uh, and so uh, in that respect, they're quite similar. I once had, uh, so I've spent time in, in Germany. I spent two years when I was a, a doctoral student and then went back for my uh, first research sabbatical. And during the research sabbatical, I got to uh, brief the newly elected government in Baden-Württemberg, which remarkably uh, featured a Green Party uh, uh, minister president. Yeah, so the uh, the, the premier uh, in Canadian terms of that state was a Green, Winfried Kretschmann. And this was his innovation team, his innovation table that I was, I was asked to give a talk about um, Canadian immigration policy and what Germany could learn from it and with special emphasis on Baden-Württemberg. And Stuttgart, as many of our, our audience will know, is sort of the seat of uh, many large firms in Germany. And so some of the representatives of those firms were there and they said, oh God, you know, this was 2012, so the process of transformation that I tried to encapsulate today was about halfway there, right? And they were complaining that, boy, we need more workers. We need more skilled workers. We need more young people. We want them to come here and have children so we can replenish uh, the stock of people who take vocational training and, and do the apprenticeships. And they were, you know, crying about their fate. Uh, so there's certainly a demand among powerful social actors, employers in Germany. Some of the largest firms are very much pro-immigration. So as is true in every other capitalist society in the world, 
the, the people who have uh, who you know have access to the means of production want more immigration. That's why the Wall Street Journal is probably the most vociferous pro-immigration in newspaper in the world. So, uh, and this is true of Canada as well. Of course, we've been having this ongoing debate about whether Canada should become a country of 100 million by the, 20, the end of this century or not. And that's a campaign, I think it's fair to say, driven for the most part by big business in Canada. And I, I don't begrudge them that. I mean, uh, it, it makes some sense, right? It's in their interest to argue for more immigration. Mm -hmm. So if that's one way to answer the question, I guess the other way is to say, has it been good for German capitalism and the German economy more generally? And again, I think the answer is yes. I mean, mm -hmm. Germany has enjoyed a sustained period of economic good times. Uh, and I think this helps explain why, even with the success of the extreme right, the big middle is quite optimistic about all sorts of things. And it's easier to be optimistic about all sorts of things when you don't feel threatened, when your status and position aren't threatened. Mm -hmm. I think this helps us understand the big difference between the refugee challenge of the early 1990s, which was also significant, and coupled with the massive return of ethnic German repatriates, and the management of the 2015 uh, spike. Um, you know, in the one case, it was much more politicized, it was much more sharp, and the, the political debates was much, were much harder because Germany was not doing as well economically. Germany had to integrate millions of East Germans you know, mm -hmm. in towns that were steadily shrinking. And had, you know, I once met a student in Berlin whose doc, his, uh, dissertation was studying how East German towns basically not collapsed, but they, they or, through an organized and administrative way, shut themselves down. Uh, so the very different circumstances. So immigration has coincided with a good time for uh, employers and capitalists in Germany and a relatively good time for workers and the general population. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so that, that probably partially answers the next question, but I'll read it to you anyway. And by the way, I'm sort of cutting off. So many of them begin with like, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, well, Angela you. Merkel has been criticized before her departure by Western political pundits that she has not been strategic enough and neglected to prepare the German economy for the future. So what is, uh, what is your opinion of that? Yeah, so I'm more of a newspaper reader than an expert on this, but uh, uh, I have seen that criticize, uh, criticism made. Um, yeah, for a country that has phased out nuclear power, Germany is, is remarkably dependent on coal. So uh, that's a hard thing to square. Um, uh, but future proofing a country is, is, is difficult and it's difficult when you face crises like the Eurozone crisis that must have uh, absorbed a great deal of processing capacity, you know, uh, of, of the chancellor and her team. Um, now, you could argue that she had four terms to do more. And I think what I see as a strength with respect to pushing reforms in immigration could be a weakness in other areas, being too pragmatic, not politically driven or ideologically driven enough might uh, leave one unable to anticipate future challenges and to settle for really incremental changes in areas that deserve more fundamental reconsideration. Uh, so without getting into the specific issue areas, uh, one could say that what is a strength with respect to immigration, this analytical, dispassionate, non-ideological pragmatism was actually an impediment to doing things that were more uh, necessary in other issue areas. Hmm. Although from what you were saying, if she didn't take the pragmatic approach, probably it sounds like she would have accomplished less. I think that's true with respect to immigration. So building on areas of common 
And she had the, the benefit of governing with her principal rival, the SPD, in two parliaments, right? So there were two grand coalitions out of the four uh, 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 governments. And so um, the first one and then the third uh, government were, were both um, uh, partnerships with the SPD. And it was a third. And anyway, most of her time in office, I, I, I made an error there and I apologize, but that's a real benefit, right? So your, your principal rival is part of your cabinet, you know, members of the high ranking members of your uh, obvious ideological uh, uh, peers, uh, antagonist peers are, are working with you. And so it's much easier to, to build pragmatic compromise positions because everyone's in the same boat, right? Once they agree to that coalition agreement, they're married for the next, until the next election, till the writ drops. So um, in some ways it was unavoidable uh, and going too far, let's say in a, in a conservative direction was just not, yeah. not possible uh, under those circumstances. And so where you do see the most change, environmental policy, immigration and others, it's because the SPD largely agrees and they can build these compromise positions between the two where no one really gets what they want and many people are, are dissatisfied, but you do have progress. That's the definition of a compromise, I guess. <clears throat> so if you've got that level of agreement, I'm jumping around a little bit. So here's a question, another crystal ball question. Um, since mass migration of refugees is perhaps as pressing a concern as climate change, we could debate the premise, can you envision a Glasgow type meeting of world leaders on the issue of absorption having any pragmatic effects? Uh, sort of a, uh, a, a meeting with respect to, uh, to immigration the absorption of migrants. Mm. Well, I mean, we've already seen this, right? The, the UN has overseen a, a global compact on, on migration. And uh, the problem is migration. And I just want to correct something I said earlier so I don't confuse anyone or I don't get hate mail. Of course, mm -hmm. the last government was also a grand coalition. So we had three of four governments that were coalitions between the union parties and the social democrats. Sorry for my brain getting stuck for a moment. So it, it's not for lack of trying that um, uh, international organizations, including the United Nations and countries have tried to develop uh, shared positions on migration. The problem is migration is that area of politics where sovereignty is most relevant, right? This is the one area that countries demand to maintain their absolute say on who can enter their territory mm -hmm. on, and on what terms. And in some ways, democratic countries are even less likely to enter into uh, compromise positions and agreements with international partners because those uh, leaders are elected. Right. And even in a country like Canada, where uh, immigration is, is supported by strong majorities and survey after survey, there's no thirst or there's no appetite uh, of Canadians for expanding immigration radically, especially expanding humanitarian immigration. Mm. So in many respects, the ability to operate a democratically viable managed migration system means that you place some limits on how many non-selected, non-economic immigrants you admit. You set the absolute terms mm -hmm. and you deal with those unwanted, unselected migrants on uh, your terms as well. Um, and major countries of immigration are not going to give that up. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at which countries are actually accepting the largest share of refugees, it's none of the big industrialized democracies. Turkey accepts many more. Iran accepts many more. And it's, I think in the case of Iran, the fact that it's not a democratic regime is not inconsequential or not, you know, a coincidence. Um, so where your neighborhood is, is important. Uh, you know, where, where you are, Canada is shielded by geography, by three oceans, and so receives very few unwanted immigrants. But when they do arrive, it's quite remarkable to see how agitated Canadians can get by a few boats uh, washing up on the maritime shores or on the West Coast. 
Uh, and this has been true for as long as Canada has had an immigration policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I am interested in is trying to explore this relationship between having a democratically viable managed migration system and a attitudes and approaches towards unwanted migration and asylum seeking in particular. And I think you can make a pretty strong case with as you move towards a managed migration system as Germany has, you necessarily become much stricter on unwanted migration. Mm -hmm. And so 2015, uh, again in Germany is the exception that proves the rule. It was a really noteworthy gesture of humanitarian openness. And it speaks to Merkel's background that we didn't talk about. I mean, being someone raised in East Germany in a country that you know, had guard towers keeping people in, I think the idea of building fences and aiming guns at people trying to get into Germany in, in August and September 2015 was something that was not on the table for her. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, she, by 2016, uh, she's already promising that this will never happen again. And I didn't use the term because it's some, it is distasteful, but some others have said never again you know, takes on a very different connotation in this respect, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I showed that graph about asylum applications since 2016. They've steadily gone down. They're now at a level that they were in 2013, 2012, 13. My guess is that they're going to continue to decrease over time mm -hmm. because not because Germany is closing itself to immigration. It's because it's opening itself to immigrants that are selected through a managed system. Yes. So... Could, could the international community do more? Well, let's see what the results are of, of uh, the current meeting yeah, in the United Kingdom, in Scotland. Uh, I don't expect a whole lot, frankly, and I'd expect much less uh, mm -hmm. on any attempt to do something similar with immigration because it's even harder to build uh, mutual positions given the conflicting interests in the migration sphere as it is in environmental policy. Mm -hmm. Plus, I would imagine that environmental policy, I mean, we know that climate change is global and, you know, air pollution, ocean pollution doesn't respect borders, whereas migration, you could almost see as a zero sum. If you if you take these people, we don't have to, or if we take these people, there'll be fewer going to use. So I think that makes it much harder for kind of international agreements. That's, thank you, Carol. And that gets to one of the areas where Angela Merkel failed, frankly, with respect to immigration, trying to build greater agreement among EU partners to share the, the burden, yeah. especially with respect to forced migration and refugee flows. France has simply refused. Right. And Italy turns them back at sea. Yeah, that's right. And, and of course, the East and Central European countries have actively opposed Germany uh, and Merkel on this issue. Uh, Brexit in some ways can be understood by Britain's uh, absolute insistence that it not be part of any kind of European-wide system of migration regulation. And so the question raised was an excellent question. You know, in some ways it's obvious that you need uh, some kind of agreement among countries to manage what is a global problem. But on the other hand, what we see is the failure of this to work. And it's not to say it always fails. At the end of the Second World War, we had tens of millions of displaced people and the United States strong-armed Canada and other countries to take them in and to resettle them. We saw something similar with less active intervention on the part of the Americans after uh, the, the fall of Saigon and uh, the, the exodus of so-called bull people in the mid and late 1970s. Uh, much greater cooperation and openness. So we have seen a shift since the end of the Cold War. And that's something that scholars have been working on, uh, but I, I don't think has been explained as well as it, it should be. Um, Here's a question. Can you comment on Germany's recent stance on Belarus-Poland migrant border crisis and how the new chancellor might deal with this? You know, I can only say that the German position, I imagine, is the EU position. Mm -hmm. And that is that uh, 
Lukashenko is uh, doing this purposely in retaliation to sanctions. And so I was heartened to see that uh, instead of backing down, they're threatening an intensification of sanctions. Mm -hmm. I think that's the right approach, uh, even though in the short term, it may lead to greater um, chaos at the border. And that is, in human terms, a real tragedy for those people who are being directed to the border points. Mm -hmm. But again, it speaks to, you know, it's not only Poland who is uh, patrolling those borders, it's the EU more generally acting through Poland, mm -hmm. acting through Greece, acting through Italy, acting through those countries at the perimeter of the European Union uh, to keep unwanted, unselected migrants out. Right. Okay, here is a long one. Uh, thank you for a very interesting and informative talk, Phil. Um, somebody who knows you, I guess I'm not meeting every of these names. Canada's conservatives, I think I skipped one. Canada's conservatives have been seen by some as pragmatic outliers relative to other conservative parties in being relatively pro-immigration and reaching out to ethnicized and racialized voters. If it is fair to put her and her party under that umbrella, does Merkel's approach, aside from some prior remarks, Ray multiculturalism, belie that understanding in a comparative context today? Did that come through? Do I need to read that again? You could repeat the second half of it. Yeah. The Canadian stuff I caught. Okay. If it is fair to put her and her party under that umbrella, mm -hmm. does Merkel's approach belie that understanding? in a comparative context. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Look, I think the Conservative Party of Canada recognizes that uh, they cannot win if they don't compete yeah. in the greater Toronto-Hamilton area. The greater Toronto-Hamilton area has the greatest concentration of federal ridings in the country, and also the greatest concentration of immigrant and second generation people in the country. And so uh, taking an anti-immigrant uh, position, so it's just not rational, it makes no sense. And so what do you do in the ridings that you have a high concentration of a particular ethnicized or racialized group, you run a candidate that comes from that group, as do the liberals. So we have this quite remarkable shift in, in uh, who runs for, uh, uh, for, for seats in Canada based on this competition among the parties for the support of new Canadians. Yeah. Is something similar happening in Germany? Well, <clears throat> not to the same extent, but it is true as a former colleague who's now at the University of Constance has pointed out, this is the most diverse uh, Bundestag parliament in, in German history in a sense, right? And when I began studying uh, immigration in Germany, there was one Turkish origin member of the Deutsche Bundestag, yeah? And now there's, there's many. It's, it's not such a big deal now. Mm. And not only children of Turkish guest workers, but people who have come as immigrants themselves or children from other groups. I mean, it's quite remarkable. So the parties are responding to a changing, especially urban uh, society by adapting their electoral strategies, by adapting their choice of candidates. It works differently in Germany because the, the system of candidate selection is different. There's a lot of interesting research on this. But the general point that I think the questioner is getting at is pretty clear that it becomes less uh, reasonable to be sharply anti-immigrant uh, in a situation where immigrants and their children and grandchildren are becoming taking up a greater share of the of the voting public yeah mm -hmm. um unless you're in the united states <laughs> well even there you know after obama's re-election the second uh, electoral victory i was in germany at the time and the headline of the frankfurt allgemeine zeitung the FAZ, is uh you know everyone has to rethink all the conservative parties now have to rethink their position on this uh, because he's demonstrated that you you need to be open to uh, previously excluded groups or groups that have traditionally been, been marginalized. I don't think that's wrong. I think uh, we're going through an interesting period of transition and this, this populist wave that we've seen, you know, it doesn't, 
it's a complicated story that's really dependent on how things work in particular places, right? How the the interplay of of concentration of peoples, electoral systems, and citizenship policies and voting rules all come together and either amplify or or minimize the the efficacy of of ethnicized and racialized minorities. In the German case, at least, and in Great Britain, I would argue, I think the trend is towards parties becoming more cognizant of the importance of these voters and adapting their strategies in a pragmatic sense so that they're more competitive. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. the, the CDU cannot, and Laschet, who was proved to be a terrible chancellor candidate by all accounts, right? He just was not a very charismatic or effective campaigner. But when he was minister president of North Rhine-Westphalia, he made a career of being very pragmatic and open to immigrants and immigration and a pro-integration uh, politician. So in some ways, his selection uh, speaks to a more general trend that I think sometimes we, we don't pick up on in North America because we are so struck and mortified by the success of the extreme right. Right. So I don't know if this sort of loops us back a little bit, but this questioner says, I cannot remember when, but at one of the CDU party conventions a few years back, Merkel came out strongly against multiculturalism, mm -hmm. something along the lines of multikulti ist eine Lebenslüge. Given Canada's commitment to multiculturalism, could you comment on this differing approach to integration, for mm -hmm. instance, demonstrating commitment to German language and values, mm -hmm. values in quotes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wrote a, a paper on this with a, a colleague in sociology here at the University of Toronto. She uh, looked at the Netherlands and I looked at Germany and our title was, is multiculturalism dead, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is around the time of, of Merkel's statement. She said, Multikulti ist gescheitert, is, is sort of, you know, it, it, it's just kaput. But what Germans understand by, by, by multiculturalism isn't what Canadians understand by multiculturalism. Because at the very same time, they're pushing for Willkommenskultur, a welcoming culture. They're pushing for integration policies. They're pushing for... 600 hours of language training and 100 hours of civics uh, training. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of this thing, Canadians go, well, what's multiculturalism? It's sort of a strategy of settlement and integration in part. And what is a welcoming culture? It's a, try, it's a, it's a message, a kind of propaganda by the state to say, yeah, we welcome you. We want to build a society that's welcoming. What does it mean to have openings in, in the, the administrative structure of the state. You know, it's a kind of multiculturalism. What does it mean to work with groups to try to build effective interventions uh, on issues such as honor marriage or uh, other things? You know, the recognition that you can't make progress unless you work with groups. Well, working with groups means acknowledging the reality of groups, which is a kind of politics of recognition, yeah? Mm -hmm. so, Yes, she made that statement. It was reported very widely, but that's a very German debate. Multiculturalism in the German scene was really about anything goes, laissez-faire, non-policy, and simply celebrating difference for the sake of celebrating difference. And the response was that, no, we don't do multiculturalism, we do integration, which means the state intervening to try to come up with a, a, a goal, a policy objective, which means bringing people up to the same level, giving them the same range of chances, chance gleichheit, right? Equality of chances. That's what we want to do. That's what the state can do. Multikulti is just celebrating food and dance and music and, and not caring about the really serious stuff. But in Canada, I don't think we understand multiculturalism is just a celebration, right? It's, it's official government policy. It's ingrained in the constitution in some ways. And so what's evolved in Germany under Merkel's watch, this idea of a Willkommenskultur, this idea of a, an integration country, uh, and increasingly a country that is cognizant of the fact that it needs to compete for uh, highly skilled immigrants makes that difference uh, much less obvious than it was in 2005. Yeah, 
And no one, again, no one predicted this. I didn't predict it. Uh, no one I know said uh, Germany were, would be where it is today. And in fact, the 2012 speeches, I think that's when she gave that speech in Munich to the, to the young CDU, um, the, the youth wing of the party. Uh, people said, well, here, there you go, right? She's no different than, than previous uh, German chancellors. Um, but I don't think she ever uttered or came close to uttering, Germany is not an immigration country. Mm. Because she's, that would be dishonest to herself, right? And uh, that is a, a kind of interesting character trait of this politician. I don't think she's capable of lying to herself, to saying something so transparently uh, false. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So multi-culti, yeah, that was meant to energize the youth wing of the CDU, to give them something to get excited about, at least the conservatives in the party. But it was counterbalanced with this continuing emphasis, emphasis on welcoming culture and integration, which are not that much different than multiculturalism in Canada, I would argue. Okay. Um, so this might be the last question then. Uh, thank you for this insightful presentation. I'm a Woodsworth alum and just moved to Berlin in the fall to start my master's. Great. Uh, you mentioned Germany's integration action plan earlier. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how does it compare to Canada's effort and tools to help immigrants integrate. Canada is, is, is decades ahead of Germany uh, because Canada has been doing this quite consciously for, for much longer. You know, as I pointed out in the lecture, Germany had no immigration or integration policy to speak of until very recently, really until uh, the 2006 national integration plan, which is not to say that integration didn't occur. Of course it occurred. People live in the country, they went to school, they opened businesses, etc. But the active intervention of governments was, was very haphazard and ad hoc. And most of the work, frankly, was done at the state and local levels, the federal government, because if you insist that you're not an immigration country, you're not going to make commitments to encourage integration. On the contrary, uh, through the coal years, the, the point was to deepen exclusions, right, to make it harder for people to become members of the society with status, with citizenship, with uh, good residency rights, etc. That only changes in 1998 with the Red-Green Coalition, and especially after the first Grand Coalition in 2005, 2005 to 9. We've been doing this arguably for as long as we've had uh, immigration since the turn of the 20th century. And so that system, the network of, of non-governmental organizations that operate at the local level with the assistance of the provinces and especially the federal government has evolved over the course of many, many decades, especially since the 1960s and 70s. So now having said that, what's happened in Germany in a very short period of time, not unlike when the Germans decided to do industrialization, you know, the Brits were way ahead, but what they managed to do in a very short period of time was astounding to the point where they quickly passed the Brits as the industrial powerhouses. What they've managed to do with respect to integration policy and the coordination of policies across federal, state, and local governments is, is quite striking and uh, speaks to what can be achieved when, when governments put their mind to it and work together. So I think the differences are still pretty important, but the, 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 the width of the gap between the two countries is narrowing. Um, and again, Germany is Europe's premier immigration country. Mm -hmm. Lots of people wanna go there. And then lots of people want to study there. When they're done studying, lots will want to stay there. And they recognize that and they've adapted their policies to international students to enable a form of highly skilled immigration policy as we have here. So there's nothing like learning by doing. And the Germans have to learn by doing because they are now a country that accepts a lot of immigrants. And so I think Germany's approach will not necessarily look like Canada's, uh, but they'll evolve into something that suits their needs. Uh, and they have to, because they've already crossed the threshold. You can't walk that back very easily. Yeah, you can't undo that, right? Yeah. I think that's an excellent note on which to end. Um, I want to thank you. I've, I have learned so much in the last hour and a quarter. Um, 
on a topic I admit I didn't know that much about, but now I'm going to go and read up on it. Um, it also makes me think I'm, I'm an immigrant to Canada too from the United States. And I remember when I did the citizenship test, and I think a lot of the questions were about multiculturalism. Yeah. That was one of the things they wanted to make sure that, that immigrants knew. Um, and I also remember I was um, a little bit later tutoring an adult ESL learner. And in the book that she was in, not, not sure why this was in there, but she, she asked me, what is portage? <laughs> this is what they thought that, this, that the new immigrants needed to learn. Portaging, that's great. Portaging, yeah. And I couldn't exactly explain it. But. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And that is one area where our politics uh, often, uh, we have these fights about what should be in the guide that immigrants read to, to prepare for the, their naturalization test. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I yeah. recollect just multiculturalism and recycling with what was in the guide. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, very good. Well, thank you so much, thank uh, you so Carol. Much. Yeah. Um, that was really great. And thank I you. and thank you to everyone for their questions. They're yeah. it's wonderful. It's been a great audience, great questions. So thank you all. And thank you to Ben for the help. And Stephanie, if she has not, if her computer's still working, if she's still here. Thanks yeah. so much, Phil. From me as well. Okay, good night, everyone.